dive into some seasonal plants and holiday gifts, mainly uh, the plant kind. Um, I find that, uh, that plants are a great hostess gift um, when you're going to somebody else's house for a holiday gathering and you can never have too many plants, right? Even if a gardener says, oh, I'm full up, there's no, no such thing as too many amaryllis, too many paper whites, too many poinsettias, keep those gifts coming. So even if five other people bring the hostess a plant, that, that's more, the more the merrier. So I'm gonna dive into this talk in alphabetical order and we'll leave plenty of time at the end for specific questions about holiday care and stuff, but I hope I will answer most of your questions during this talk. So in our alphabetical order, our first holiday plant I wanna talk about is amaryllis. And if you join me at Homestead's talk last month, uh, which you should still be able to find on their Facebook page and on YouTube, I talked a lot about planting spring blooming bulbs, forcing bulbs over the winter time into bloom. And we did cover amaryllis and paper whites to a little extent, but I'm gonna go over that again because that is such um, a top holiday gift. So when you bring home a new amaryllis from the store, so you've just purchased it from Homestead, one of these beautiful amaryllis, they come pre-chilled. And what you wanna look for is big bulbs. The bigger the bulb, the better. You wanna look for firm, really nice, healthy size bulbs. You can often get, just like this one right here, two uh, blooms um, coming out of it, not just one with those bigger bulbs. And I also love this picture because it shows, it's kind of set it and forget it. Like you can put it in pebbles, you can pot it up in a heavy clay pot so it doesn't tip over like it's trying to here. But notice that it is growing in nothing. It has not even been watered. It is just jumping out of the box into bloom. And that's because it's been preset and chilled and done for you. So you can even lay it on a mantle and you might've seen some of those waxed amaryllis bulbs. Um, just to let you know that that's holding in the moisture and getting it through the one growing season, but that's meant to be a disposable plant when it's waxed like that um, and not grown for uh, in continuing years. So I do want to talk about you have amaryllis already and what to do with them. So if you purchased amaryllis in previous years and you want to get them to bloom again, right after they are done flowering and the flower starts to bite, die back, you wanna cut back that flower stalk and discard it, but you're gonna leave the leaves up because the leaves are where the plant takes in its energy. So you leave those leaves up. If you can give it a summer vacation outdoors, they really enjoy that and they become much stronger, better bulbs with an outdoor summer vacation. If you do some of them outdoors in mid-August, you wanna bring them in start to withhold watering, let the foliage die back naturally, and then store the bulb in a cool, dry place for a minimum of eight weeks. So what I do is I get an old cardboard box or tub, cut back the foliage if it hasn't died back already at the beginning of September, and I put it in the closed cardboard box in a closet somewhere, somewhere cool and dry. And then I mark the calendar, because I don't want to forget about my bulbs, for eight weeks from there, pull them back out, start to water them, put them in a sunny windowsill, and about five to eight weeks later, you'll see a flower stalk coming out, and then the foliage will come after that, and voila, new bulbs, new flowers for that season. And I was going to say that sometimes you'll notice when you give it that summer vacation that it has like a little baby on the side. It might have a second bulb growing with it. You can repot it when you bring it in, um, after the summer outside. And if you have a second bonus bowl, put that in another pot. You wanna make sure that they are pot bound, meaning that they're pretty tight in there with just a little bit of soil around it. You don't wanna stick them in a pot with tons of soil around them. They like to be really tight in there. Um, and that sparks some of that re-blooming for you. All right, so we're gonna jump into our next uh, af in alphabetical order, which is azaleas. So. These azaleas are being sold in the holiday seasons, usually white, pink, red tones, and they're more of a tender azalea. Um, they're more meant as house plants than they are for planting outside. You could take a chance next spring and plant them out and see if they do well, 
But again, these are florist azaleas that have been bred and grown in greenhouses in very protected um, and insulated conditions. So they are not specifically bred to be hardy azaleas. So if you get something from the florist, that's a different type of azalea that might not be hardy for our outdoor winters. They do prefer bright and direct light. They like a little bit of fertilizer and cool temps. 60 degree is ideal. A lot of us keep our houses a little bit warmer than that. Um, so if you have like a sunroom or some place in your house that stays a little bit cooler in the winter, um, you can do that. And they are usually, as I said, greenhouse grown and hardy only to zone 10. But take a chance if you want to and, and see if they do well outside and never let them dry out. And that's usually when they start to drop their leaves and look oh, kind of sickly and unhappy. It's because either they have too much moisture or they've dried out too much in between watering. So you wanna pick up the pots and I'll kind of demonstrate with my mug here. Every once in a while with any house plant or any plant you have in your house, pick it up and feel the weight. And if it feels heavy and full of water, then you don't need to water it that day. Um, if it feels all of a sudden lighter, then you know that the soil has dried out and that you need to water it. And we'll talk a little bit about, more about watering and some of the other plants we talk about coming up. So next is the classic Christmas cactus or Thanksgiving cactus. There's even an Easter cactus. So there's a lot of confusion about the Christmas cactus. A lot of people have been given a cactus, a Schomburgia, and they were told it was a Christmas cactus, but it's actually a Thanksgiving cactus. And what's the difference between those? It's the bloom time. So generally, if it's blooming now in November or October, it's a Thanksgiving cactus. And if it blooms later in the winter, it's a Christmas cactus. If it blooms all the way at the end of winter, it's usually an Easter cactus. The other way we can tell the difference is by the leaf shape. So the classic Thanksgiving cactus kind of has these like horns almost, these points at the end, and then the Christmas cactus is more rounded and gentle, and then the thing, Easter one is even more rounded, and I'll show you a couple photos because the, the drawing is great, but the pictures show up much better. So Thanksgiving cactus in bloom now at Homestead, and you see how it has these kind of sharp points to it. So there's your Thanksgiving cactus. Christmas cactus at Homestead last winter, look at that rounded tips so a little bit rounded more paddles to it there so that's just the difference and it's really just a matter of bloom time uh, um, you don't have to worry too much about the difference they they have the same care um, same conditions and i'll talk a little bit in the next slide about propagating it too so to force the buds on a christmas cactus that you have um, that you've wintered over and you've been growing it as a house plant for the last year, you wanna place it into a cooler room and give it 13 hours of darkness. So we wanna make it think it's going into winter time. So again, that could be a porch or a garage or somewhere um, that's cooler than you keep your general house. And then you'll bring it in at the beginning of November about now after you've done that for several weeks and that will force it into bloom. Um, and then let's talk about propagation a little bit. So here's a little one I got a cutting of. So here's this little Christmas cactus and notice it's more the rounder one. Let's see if I can hold it up to the microphone. Uh, I mean the camera there, there we go. So a little bit rounder. Notice three sections and then it's starting to root. So here's the little roots. That's really hard to see on the camera there. So I just have it in this little thimble medicine and I put it in water and put it in a sunny windowsill and then it developed roots, developed roots and then you just pot it up into soil just like you would any other plant. And I say three sections as a minimum. So on the one here in this picture, I'm gonna count back one, two, three sections pinch that off and then put that pinched end down in water in a cup in a sunny windowsill. And I'm gonna scroll back to the Thanksgiving one here because I think I can show the sections much better. So we're not gonna count the flower, one section, two section, three section. Then you pinch that off right there and then put that in water. Um, 
So I'll set that aside right now. And I think I had a question coming through. Yeah. So Pat is asking, can you just put it in the dirt to propagate it? Now, um, it sometimes will propagate okay if you put a little um, root starter on it or something, but it's generally much more reliable. I've never had it fail to put it in a little cup of water and after two or three weeks, bam, roots and then pot it up. It's very quick that way. Sometimes what happens if you put it in soil is the cut part heals over and then it never develops roots. It kind of just sits there and it never dries out, never really does anything for you. All right, so next is our beautiful cyclamen collections. I'm becoming a bigger and bigger fan of cyclamen. I just think they're so beautiful with those heart-shaped leaves. And then you have all these beautiful colors from whites to pinks to purples and reds. And so it's a corm. It's a big bowl that's in under that plant there. So it's different than a plant with like tons of roots, like a poinsettia or something. So you have to remember that that corm is there because a lot of the failure that comes from growing cyclamen is because it's getting overwatered and water is sitting in the top of the corm and rotting it out. So we'll talk about that in a minute. So while in bloom, you can keep the root ball moist. You will water around the edge, like under the leaves, but not directly into the center. And you could feed it, give it a little bit of fertilizer every two weeks to keep that blooming going through the winter time. Um, you can put it in a tray fill the tray with water and then have the water come up through the bottom that way. If you're worried about overwatering from overhead, that's another good way to do it. If there's any yellowing leaves or spent flowers, you can just pinch those out after the foliage starts to die back, which is usually about next February, March, the plant will start to die back slowly and you'll think that it's dead. It's not dead, it's going into its dormancy. So you didn't kill it, it's just a natural process. It comes out like every other bulb, like daffodils, tulips, just like that, it's a bulb. It comes on for one season, dies back, stores its energy, and then comes back the next year. So that's why there's a lot of confusion about cyclamen as a house plant, because people will try to keep it green and growing all throughout the year when it needs to go back into its dormancy, into the bulb. So we can move it outside in April and keep it in its pot for a couple weeks, get it hardened off, and then you can actually plant it in the ground where it can absorb energy and nutrients and stuff, get revitalized, and then in midsummer, dig up that corm, pot it back up, place it in a warm place, and then it will start to reflower for you next fall. Um, so just to let you know also that um, there are miniature cyclamens and there are the big flora cyclamens, which we're, we're showing here. There are hundreds and hundreds of little cyclamens that you can collect. And the miniature and hardy cyclamens can stay outside in your garden all year round. The ones we're talking about here are, of course, the flora cyclamen. All right. So I'm going to go on to Christmas rose. So I put this under the seas because even though we also know it as hellebore or the Latin name helleborus, at this time of year, you can buy potted up Christmas rose or hellebore as a gift plant from the stores and give that as a hostess gift. Makes a great cut flower. If it blooms at the end of winter, it's known as Lenten rose. If it blooms at the beginning of winter, it's known as Christmas rose. So same thing with that Thanksgiving cactus and Christmas cactus. It's just when the bloom time of the plant is, is the big difference between those two. So the potted plants prefer coolness. And if you do have it inside the house, I would say only keep it inside for about two or three weeks at the most. And then uh, you want to plant it outside. And any time that the soil can be worked, you can plant your hellebore outside. So it could be even in the middle of January or February, as long as you can dig into the soil and work it, you can plant your hellebore back out and it, you'll want to um, plant it pretty soon after you have it as an indoor decoration plant over the holidays. And then it will come back and rebloom for you every year outside because it is a cold hardy plant in our area. And this is just showing here a bunch of the flowers cut off and floated in a shallow basin of water um, because if you 
might have noticed on the plant for the hellebore or the Lenten rose or the Christmas rose that they tend to hold their flowers down like this and dangle down and you don't often get to see those beautiful faces that you see in this picture here. So you can cut off those flowers, float them in water and they will last for several weeks cut like that. Um, just beautiful. Right, so next uh, is popular hostess gift this time of year is the gardenia. And these are semi-hardy in our area and the florist or greenhouse grown ones are more of a house plant than they would be for outside. They are breeding for more hardy gardenias that are kind of zone seven, zone eight plants for us. Um, but in this case, this is more of a greenhouse grown plant. Um, you want to keep it in as much direct light as possible. So that's why I'm recommending the south facing window. After it blooms, you can give it a little haircut and prune it back. You want to keep the soil moist, but not soaking, meaning we never want it to ever dry out, but you don't want it to be like running down with water either. Um, and it prefers relative humidity around 50 to 60%. Most of our houses in wintertime are around 10% to 20% humidity. So that's where you see the struggle a lot of times with growing gardenias inside. If you have a greenhouse, if you have a place that you can keep a high humidity or a humidifier in, that would be uh, ideal for the gardenia. You might notice some leaf drop or some yellowing um, in your house because it is a dry situation normally in the wintertime for us. All right, so next is our Norfolk Island Pine. And a lot of people use this as their holiday tree or their Christmas tree or their living Christmas tree because it comes potted. It uh, normally is two to three feet high, can get up to six or eight feet high. This is not a true pine. It is a tropical plant. Um, so it does not want to be outside in the wintertime. You can bring it outside in the summer to give it a summer vacation and then has similar care to the gardenia, which is again that um, high humidity, bright direct sunlight, south facing if you can give it and kind of like that greenhouse conditions. Um, it can start to dry out if it doesn't get high humidity or and consistent moisture or if you forget a watering and the soil ever dries out. So this is again, one that you wanna keep consistently moist. A good idea is to keep a, a tray of pebbles full of water below it. So that can give it some humidity and it can also draw on that water if it ever totally dries out for you. But it's a nice um, substitute for a artificial tree or anything like that because it, it's kind of fluffy feeling, it's kind of soft edges to the pine needles. And again, not a true pine, more related to tropical ferns than, than um, to pine trees. All right, so next is our similar plant that can be used as a substitute holiday tree, which is the lemon cypress. And cypress, not hardy <laughs> in the mid-Atlantic area. So that's obviously from the Mediterranean. Um, so these are going to be, again, treated as houseplants, or you can treat it as an annual to enjoy and then compost it afterwards. So these are just 18 inches to two feet tall, make a really cute little um, tabletop display or centerpiece with these. Again, like the Norfolk pine, they like bright light. They want to be kept kind of on the cool side around 55 to 60 degrees. Never let them dry out. Same thing with the, the Norfolk pine and can summer outdoors, same as the gardenia and the Norfolk pine. But the rest of the year, you would treat it as you would um, a house plant that likes bright light. Um, and it's also got that nice fluffy um, feel to it. It doesn't have sharp edges like some of the other um, pine trees would. So people like to use that as a little substitute for maybe like a, a side holiday tree on a table. Okay, next, orchids. Well, we can do a whole hour long on orchids easily. We could do several hours on orchids. Just to say orchids are a wonderful holiday gift and hostess gift anytime. There are so many, many kinds of orchids. There's slipper orchids that look like that little pouch underneath. There's um, 
uh, sprays of orchids, there's native orchids, but the most common one you're going to find, and uh, this is a photo from Homestead, is the moth orchid. So this is the moth orchid with that open face right there, or Phalaenopsis is the Latin name. So you probably saw the ads or read the tags that say, put a shot glass of water or an ice cube in them. Ignore that <laughs> advice. Um, it's an epiphyte. It lives on the side of trees with bare roots and absorbs moisture from the humid air in the tropics and the jungle. So think about that when you're watering your orchid. So what you want to do is run water over it as if a rainstorm happened, let it drain out that extra water in the sink, and then put it back where you have it growing. And it likes bright and direct light. It likes a little bit of liquid orchid fertilizer, and you can have it repotted or repot it yourself in new bark every two to three years. And you want a well-draining uh, medium or bark mix for that. And then my last piece of advice here about orchids is neglect it <laughs> because the more you fuss over it and play with it, the less successful it usually is. Orchids thrive on neglect. Again, they were, you know, native to the side of a tree where they're just hanging out by themselves with no human care, going through their cycle of blooming and not blooming, blooming and dormancy without any human interference. So uh, the kind of the trick for a lot of people is to water it less than you think it needs watering and to just put it in a window and neglect it for a while. And then all of a sudden one day you'll walk by and you'll start to see buds develop and a new um, flower stem come up and you'll be like, wow, it's reblooming for me. Yay. <laughs> so that's my best orchid advice is not to fret about it. Don't watch it like uh, they always say, uh, watch pot never boils. Well, a watched orchid never reblooms. But the second you turn your back to it, walk away, tend to other things, you come back a few weeks later and bam, it's reblooming for you. All right, so let's go on to another fun holiday plant that's getting more and more popular in the last few years is the ornamental pepper. Um, so this is um, in the fall section at uh, Homestead, but can go into the Christmas and holiday season because ornamental peppers are now being bred for all these beautiful colors and tones, these jewel tones, and they almost look like Christmas bulb lights. So there's ones that have red and purple. There's ones that start off red and turn to black or orange or yellow. And you can have ones with multiple colors all on the same plant. The other breeding being done is to get the foliage to have white streaks or to be super purple black. And then that makes the red um, peppers really pop or the yellow or orange or whatever color tones you pick. So these are decorative peppers. They can be eaten. You're not going to die from them. Um, they're just not very tasty because they've been bred for their looks. So just to let you know that if you do chomp on one, Eh, you're not going to be that happy about it. <laughs> it's probably going to be super hot and kind of bitter. You can overwinter them as house plants, so they can be outside. They can withstand a tiny bit of frost, but they really want to be coming in when there's any frost or freeze outside. And they can be overwintered on a sunny windowsill as a house plant and then put back outside next spring when the temperatures go above 60 again. And as I said, there's many new colors and combinations available in both the peppers and the foliage. They're really fun to mix with the different mum colors. They're fun to have a series of them down the center of the table just because they do look like Christmas lights with that shape on the top sticking up right there. All right, so next let's talk a little bit about paper whites, which we talked about in the bold uh, last month as well. So paper white bulbs you're going to buy at Homestead are pre-chilled for you. They're ready to go. As soon as you put them in a little bit of water and as soon as you anchor them down, they're going to just take off and bloom for you. So that means that you can buy them as bulbs now and hold on to them for a few weeks and do a couple one week start it in water, start to put it in a pebble tray or with marble chips or, or actually plant it in soil if you want to, and then maybe do a few more the next week and a few more the next week. 
And then that way you can get a long season of bloom of your paper whites instead of all of them blooming at once. So you could do that. And mostly they last for about two to three weeks in bloom. So I just wanna to caution to fill up the water to the bulb's hips. So let's see if I can find something to show you like a hip. So pretend this little cup is a paper white bulb. So the hips would be down here, the bottom third, and the shoulders would be up here. So you want to fill the water just to the hips, just touching the bottom of the bulb for the roots to go into. So you don't want to rot the bulb by covering it totally in water or soaking it in water because um, it will start to rot out. And then uh, my little piece of advice to pickle them was from a study done about 10 years ago where they put some paper whites in straight water, some paper whites in vodka, and then they did different, they did 20%, 40%, 60%, 80% vodka water combinations, and they were calling it pickling the paper whites. And what they were trying to do was achieve paper whites that stay shorter and don't get all leggy and flop over for you. And so they found that 20% is fine, 20% um, alcohol to water solution will keep the growth a little bit stunted and it won't harm the bulbs at all. They'll still water just, uh, still flower just as they would if they were in straight water. And then there are different varieties of paper whites. So most of us are used to the Ziva, which is the stinky one. And some people find the scent of paper whites to be a little astringent or too sweet or too strong. So if you're looking for paper whites that are a little less strong in strength, you can look out for other varieties of the Tazitas that are less fragrant. Sometimes it'll say Narcissus paper whites on the label. Sometimes it will just say um, Christmas daffodil or it'll have another label like that, but just look for some of the others that are pre-chilled that are blooming and Narcissus for the Christmas or holiday time period. And some of them actually will also come in more of a white yellow tone, more on the daffodil side, because these are daffodil relatives, than uh, the white side. And those are a little bit sweeter and lighter scented. All right, so let's talk a lot about poinsettias. <laughs> so we got a lot to share about poinsettias. So our first tip is buy fresh. And what do I mean by fresh? So this is from Homestead in the last few days. So this is the actual flower of the poinsettia. These are the bracts and leaves that we're looking at the color at around it. And these, this is what we love about poinsettias are these beautifully colored bracts and leaves. But this little yellow guy in the center, that's the actual flower. So you want to buy your poinsettias when those little yellow flowers are just breaking open from their little green buds. So this one is just coming out, just fresh here. There's a little green bud here, a little green bud here. This yellow one is just emerging. So you don't want it when the, the flowers have fully opened and are starting to die back. And so look closely at those little, little tiny flowers in the center and that's your clue. Um, to how fresh the poinsettia is. So when you get it as they're just opening up as they are here at Homestead, then you know you have several weeks of life uh, left for the poinsettia this season. So a um, couple tips on poinsettia care, and this applies to a lot of the plants that we're talking about here today. Um, a lot of them, as you noted, may have noted are tropical plants. So like the Norfolk pine, the lemon cedar, the gardenia, the orchids, they all like cool temps, but they never wanna be frosted or frozen. They never wanna go below 50 degrees or so. So when you buy your plants from Homestead, you wanna protect them on the way home. And my biggest advice is to purchase your plants last on your shopping trips. So don't go to the store and buy your plants and then go stop at the grocery store and five other stops and have them in your cold car because um, they will get exposed to the frost or fr freezing temps and you're warm when you're in your car and then you turn on the heat high right when you're in the car and then you get out of the car and then high heat and you get out of the car so those poor plants on your way home if you make several stops are going from like super high heat to freezing to super high heat to freezing so that's a lot of trauma and a lot of the reason why sometimes you'll get 
uh, orchid home or something and it's like been through so much stress just getting to your house. So make it your last step stop on the way home or to the hostess or wherever you, the final destination for that plant is. Make sure it is wrapped well. So it could be in a plastic sleeve or some other kind of protection to get from the store to into your car if it's far away. Um, so just have some protection around it so it doesn't get exposed to the freezing temps and wind outside or make it really brief between that those two periods of being inside to outside and back inside again. And then poinsettia is like bright but direct sun unless the window is facing east. So I would recommend um, south facing um, or I would say north and west facing is your best windows for poinsettia. They don't want to be in direct, direct sunlight. And then away from drafts or direct heat sources. So that means don't set them over a humidifier. Don't set them on a radiator or like um, some electronics, like your computer might be giving off heat. So if you set it next to a, a computer monitor or something, make sure it's not radiating heat from there. And away from any drafts, like right inside a doorway where it's being constantly open and closed and getting drafts from the cold outside. And then when you get home, you can remove the direct decorative foil and put it in another um, nice pot. But if you want to enjoy the decorative foil, I recommend taking a pen or something and poking holes to at the bottom of that foil so it can drain out um, and then put a saucer or, or a, a little bowl or something underneath that so it can drain into there. Because what happens a lot with the poinsettia is, is you bring them home, you got them in that fancy foil, you water them, and then the water sits between the plant and that fancy foil and kind of drowns the plant and rots it right there. And then for your watering, which I said earlier, I would share some watering tips. The best thing to do is to take your plants over to your sink. So it could be your bathtub or shower too. And you're gonna water the soil, not the plant. So you can water around the soil zone again, not the leaves, not the plant. And then you're gonna water till the water is running through the bottom of the plant. And then you're gonna sit it there and let it drain out and leave it for 10 or 20 minutes to let it drain out and then put it back to where you have it growing. So you wanna water thoroughly, water till it's draining out the bottom. And then you can do that less frequently. Uh, again, you're gonna use the feel test, the heaviness test for feeling how heavy your poinsettia is. If it feels fully soggy and heavy in the pot when you go by and pick it up, then it doesn't need watering. Even if the calendar said it's been five days or so since your last time you watered it. Don't go by the calendar, don't go by a schedule, go by the feel of how heavy the soil is. You can put your finger in the top to check the moisture level too, but it's generally the heaviness of the pot. And when it feels light, that's when you take it over to the sink, do the full soaking, let it drain out, and then put it back um, where you have it growing in your home. All right, so next we're gonna go into the really complicated process of getting your poinsettia to have this beautiful um, bract color next year because we can grow poinsettias year round as house plants, but they're gonna stay green, the same green leaves all the time down here, the entire plant. Um, but if you want it to start to turn colors at the top, you're gonna have to follow this process, which is a little complicated and I'll go through it kind of quickly. Um, but if anybody wants a copy of this timeline, they can just email me and I'll put my email in the chat now. And it's really easy. It's just my name, which is under my face here, Kathy Jens at gmail.com. And I can send you this schedule here. And I like to do my schedules by the holidays because it's a good way to remember things. So we can call it early January, but I'm going to call it on New Year's Day. So New Year's Day, you've got your poinsettia that you bought this year. You can fertilize it as you would any house plant um, and then continue to provide adequate light and water it for the next several weeks. And then around Valentine's Day, check it for insect issues, white fly. It's gonna start to get a little leggy, but cut it back. So it'll start to stretch out into the, into the light. So you can cut it back to about five inches tall. And then around St. Patrick's Day, this is mid-March, right? Remove the faded and dried parts of the plant, add more soil, 
you know, like a commercial sterile soil mix for house plants, and then keep it in a bright interior location. And then that will be that way for several months until Memorial Day, when it's warm enough to go, um, trim off two or three inches of the branches and promote side branching. So that means I'm going to cut some of the branching back so it'll start to send more foliage and be a thicker, shorter plant than a big, leggy, long plant. Because I think we've all had the experience of getting a poinsettia at our office or somewhere and then putting it in a corner and, and treating it as a house plant. And you've got these long legs with no foliage right around the bottom half of them and then foliage on the top. So that's why we're doing the trimming back and the pruning back a few times to promote a full, nice, bushy looking poinsettia instead of a leggy one with no leaves on the bottom. So at that point in, around Memorial Day, you can repot it to a slightly larger container, again, using the sterile growing mix or houseplant mix. And then around Father's Day, it's mid-June and you can move it outside because it is used to outside summer temps in our area because it's from Mexico and Central America. So now it's like, I love the hot summer. Let me go outside for a bit. And you don't want to place it in direct sunlight. And that, so I'm putting here a place in indirect light. So when it first goes from an inside plant to outside, loves the hot temperature, humidity and everything. But if you put it in direct sun, it'll burn the leaves because it's not used to that much sunlight being inside. So you can gradually move it into a little bit more sunlight outside. All right, so next part of the calendar is 4th of July. Give it another trim. Again, we want to move it then gradually into full sun. You can continue to water and fertilize it. And again, we're giving it that trim again to keep it full and bushy rather than leggy. Then at the end of summer, Labor Day in our area, you can move it back indoors and start to give it at least six hours of direct light. So a sunny like south facing or east facing window is good. As new growth begins, reduce the fertilizer. And then around autumn equinox, that's when we're going to make it pretend that it's winter time. So that's when you're going to cut back uh, the amount of light it gets. And that's when you're going to keep it at low temperature, like 60 degrees. So maybe an extra bedroom, a guest room that you can turn off the heat vents in. And you're going to continue to water and fertilizer and rotate it, the plant daily. And I'm going to just say as a side comment, if you have a greenhouse, this entire process is a lot easier. <laughs> Doing this in a regular apartment or home it is complicated. Um, and then Thanksgiving discontinue the short day long night treatment of 13 hours of darkness and 11 hours of bright light where you're pretending that it's going into winter time and put that plant in a sunny place where it gets at least six hours of direct light that can be from a plant light or from a bright window and then reduce the water and fertilizer and then enjoy your new poinsettia as it puts on its new color and then the cycle uh, starts all over again so that wasn't a lot of work, was it? <laughs> that was a lot. So it's complicated, as I said, to do this, especially if you don't have a greenhouse where you can adjust the amount of hours of sunlight and you can precisely adjust the um, proportion that it gets of and temperatures. So it's tough to do this in a home, but um, it's worth it to try it a couple of times. And, it, and it's a fun experiment to do with kids to do. So, um, and again, it's less wasteful. So if you invested in a beautiful poinsettia plant and you wanna have those beautiful colors again, um, this is a fun thing to try. And I'm going to go back a little bit here just to talk about the colors for a minute. So these are some of the new poinsettias that came into Homestead over the last week or so. And notice that they're in these like peachy, pinky, creamy tones. So now breeders are breeding Thanksgiving poinsettias and Christmas poinsettias. So they're having more of the, like the, the subtle harvest tones for Thanksgiving and for fall. Um, so you'll notice more of like the golds and the peaches uh, versus the straight whites and reds for the Christmas or holiday poinsettias. And you'll even see in stores um, dyed poinsettias. They're, they're doing a floral spray on them. And this picture here where I'm showing them with a bit of glitter tossed on them. 
Um, and because these bracts, these upper leaves will fall off after the um, blooms die back this year, it's not going to harm the plant to have that on there. All right, so let's jump into our last few holiday plants. Our next are miniature roses. So again, these are greenhouse grown plants, uh, specifically grown as a house plant, but you could try them planted out in your garden next spring. And I've known several people who have really good success planting out their miniature roses. But again, just like the azaleas and some of the other plants I'm showing you here, they were uh, bred and propagated in greenhouse conditions and indoor conditions. So that's what they're optimized for. So they come usually already in bloom or bud for you. You want to look for these buds that are just starting to open. So right there's a, a closed bud and this one's just starting to open and that will give you the longest life and flowering indoors as a house plant. Deadhead often. So as soon as this flower starts to fade, I'm going to take my little kitchen snips or scissors and just snip that bloom off and that will encourage the plant to send out more flowers. Um, you can plant it outside anytime. So just like with the hellebore, as long as the soil can be worked, you can put it outside. So if it starts to fade and die back, it can go outside at any time. And roses tend to go dormant in winter time. So you'll notice sometimes that they'll start to do a leaf drop when they're inside as a houseplant after it's been forced into this early bloom for you for the holidays. So don't be alarmed. That's part of its normal shedding cycle. Just clean up those drop leaves. Don't let them stay and um, infect the plant or rot inside here. So pull out any drop leaves and just dispose of them with your compost. And then um, you can enjoy the plant as a house plant for several months and then put it out in the springtime. All right, so next I wanna talk about rosemary. So a lot of times rosemary is being sold now as a tender house plant, but it can be hardy outside. You just wanna check the label, um, which one it is. Usually for the house plant version that's meant to be in your kitchen window that is greenhouse grown, it might be pruned into a nice oval shape or like a little Christmas tree type shape. Um, so they want bright light. This is a Mediterranean herb plant, so it wants as much light as you can give it. So the sunniest windowsill you have, you can prune it regularly to keep that nice shape and, of course, to enjoy it in your cooking. Um, the water it after the top first two inches dry out. So this is one of the plants that you'll pick it up and feel the water weight, but you really need to put your finger in or maybe use a chopstick or a pencil or something to stick in there to check the water level um, because you want to keep it on the dry side, but you never want it to fully dry out. Um, so a lot of people have trouble keeping the rosemary inside over the winter time. Um, as a house plant, it is meant to be just for the holidays. So like with the poinsettia and the amaryllis, it's meant to be six to eight weeks indoors and then to be tossed aside as an annual. You can um, do a little bit of extra care for it, nurse it along and get it to go through. Um, but just know that it wasn't designed in the, in the first place for that length. So if it does die on you, it's not your fault. That's the way the, the plant was bred to be. And I'm being joined by a kitty cat right here. <laughs> so he's trying to come on camera. So next I want to go over um, some quick other holiday plant picks um, that I think are just fun and nice gifts to give for the holidays. And here I have pictured um, a red cactus that's grafted on this green one. So there's bleeding heart plant, there's bromeliads with the beautiful red centers to them. Crown of thorns has beautiful red. Jerusalem cherry, kalanchoe or kalanchoe, uh, depending on how you pronounce it, comes in whites, pinks, yellows, reds, and stromanthe, which is, oop, that's my alarm right there. So stromanthe has like a fuzzy texture to it and can be on the the streaked with red or streaked with white, but can almost look like a candy cane type plant. And that's why I've noted the trio star or the tricolor stromanthe as a really fun one that has those green and red holiday colors to them. So pretty 
much any house plant that has red bloom or has variegation to the leaf can be a great holiday plant pick just to keep with the Christmas color themes. And then I want to do a couple um, tips for the rest of your indoor plants. So this is the time of year where we've had the freeze outside our first frost maybe. You can take cuttings of our coleus, take cuttings of our spider plants, our sweet potato vine, and winter those over by starting them into propagating new roots like we did with our Christmas cactus here, and then potting them up in a light potting mix. Um, you're gonna give them a light fertilizer and then discontinue fertilizing them for the rest of the winter time because all of your house plants are going into their winter dormancy. They're slowing down. They need less water, fewer fertilizations, except for, remember we talked about cyclamen and also probably I should say an exception of orchids. You can still fertilize your orchids and cyclamen, but the rest of your house plants stop pumping them full of water and fertilizer. They want to go dormant. They want to rest a bit, just like your outdoor plants do because of the shorter hours of daylight that we have outside. They're kind of cooling down, going through a rest period and going to rebound when it starts to have longer days in the March um, period or March, April. And then collect dried flowers and grasses for indoor vases. So this is a fun time to go out in your garden and look at some of those beautiful ornamental grasses and dried flowers to make maybe a Thanksgiving arrangement with them. If you have violets or other humid loving plants, like we talked about with the um, uh, with some of the ones uh, in our talk today, you can set up a humidifier or a tray of pebbles with water sitting in them. And then the water sit on top of the, the plants sit on top of those pebbles, not in the water. So you want them on top of the pebbles above it, not soaking in the water. And then we talked about starting our spider plant and things from cuttings, but you can also do that with your violets as well to share some of those and to propagate new violets and make sure to rotate your house plants, all the plants that I've shown you today. Um, if they're sitting in a sunny spot, give them a quarter turn every time you water them. So just like a quarter turn to the right or uh, to the left, whichever you prefer, but just try to remember to do that every time so you don't get these leggy plants that are stretching out towards the sunlight and they're kind of lopsided looking. And then because our homes, especially in the wintertime, build up a lot of dust and film and pet hair, you want to go around and clean your house plants. And you don't need anything special to do that. So just a um, handkerchief, like a cotton handkerchief soaked in a little bit of water is just fine. You don't need to use milk or anything like that. So just lightly dust and clean off the foliage of your house plants so it can make chlorophyll and respirate much better. All right, and then you're gonna keep your succulents and cacti on the dry side. I'm a habitual overwaterer and I admit that. So um, that's a big reminder for myself to stop watering my cacti and succulents so much. And if you have a cut Christmas tree that you brought inside, make sure to check that water level daily because that can be really dangerous to let your Christmas tree dry, dry out on you. Um, and if you have greenery that you're putting on your front door or on a window, make sure the storm door or storm window isn't south facing because basically you're creating a little cooking uh, greenhouse between the two. And if you see sweat coming down the window, that's a good indication that condensation um, that it's too hot. Um, maybe prop open that storm door a little bit to vent that so you're not getting that big condensation and cooking your greens between those two doors or two windows. And then great time to go around your landscape to collect your holiday greens, anything that has berries on it from um, pyracantha to hollies um, to boxwood would benefit from a little bit of a pruning and they will grow back thicker for you and you can make a beautiful swag like this one here that I made for my front door there. And this is my contact information and I'm going to open it up and check for questions first from Zoom and then from Facebook. And I said my email is kathyjents at gmail.com. The blog and website is washingtongardener.blogspot.com, Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest. I'm at WDC Gardener. Facebook, you can find me at Washington Gardener Magazine and our podcast is Garden DC. 
And if you enjoyed today's talk, I'd love a review on greatbarnspeakers.com. And I am going to check the chat here. And if you want to let me know if there's any questions over or comments over at the Facebook page, just let me know. Um, so Shirley's asking, how to do you propagate violets? So let me go back to the violet picture here. Um, so what's funny is you would think you would take off a leaf from this violet, right? And then the long stem of the leaf here, you might put that in water and it would form a root. No, that's not how it works on violets. <laughs> so uh, it doesn't form new roots from there. Uh, there's two ways you get new violet plants. One is to pull the plant out of its pot and look for babies around it because it'll start to form babies on the side and you can separate it and carefully pull them apart and repot the babies. The other way is to snip off a full leaf and then you're going to have a pot of potting mix, just clean potting mix that's slightly damp. And you're gonna take the leaf, place it on the top of the potting mix, just flat, flat leaf like here, my hand is a leaf. Sometimes people will take a pin, like a little sharp pin and pin the leaf down so it has full soil contact. Because what you wanna do is have it contact the soil and after a few weeks, you'll start to see a little plant emerge from the top where it's contacted the soil. So just little baby here, little baby here, and you can snip those apart and pot them up separately. Um, some people will even take one leaf and cut it apart into different segments and do that on the surface of the soil. So it's a very different and interesting way of propagation for violets than it is for most of our other house plants that we're used to just rooting in water or using a root tone and rooting in a soil mix. So, but I'm glad you asked that. All right, so from Facebook, Rebecca says, do you think that the traditional red lasts longer than the pinks and yellows? I, and I'm assuming that means the poinsettias Nope, I don't, I don't think so. It's again, the key is that yellow center and I'm gonna scroll back all the way to that picture to show you again, this is the flower. And so the real key is to get it when the green is just cracking open to the yellow, right? Like it is in this picture here. Um, so that will make it be a much longer lasting plant inside. The other key is to keep it out of heat and cold drafts and also to keep it well watered, but not soaking. So that will make your poinsettia last much longer in your home, um, whether it's the, the new yellow tones or the gold tones or those fall tones or the red and white of the traditional ones. All right, thanks Rose, she says, great talk, thank you. Um, I think it's Jamie or Janie. Um, I read you should turn orchids a red you should turn orchids if in bloom, shouldn't turn orchids if they're not in bloom. Ah, so Danny has a good point. So I talked about turning the house plants a quarter turn every time you water them. Orchids are always the exception, right? Orchids are their own whole special baby. And that's why I said we could have a whole separate hours long discussion about orchids is yeah, you don't have to turn orchids necessarily. If you do find it starting to tilt or move the leaves or foliage a little bit towards um, the sun, you can give it a quarter turn, but don't worry too much about the orchids and moving it. All right, a couple more new messages. Thanks, Patricia. She says, excellent talk. Shirley says, what type of lights do orchids, what type of light do orchids prefer? So again, there are hundreds of different types of orchids. So some are low light plants, some are high light. Um, and that's why, and go sc scroll back to the moth orchid here. Um, moth orchids, the Phalaenopsis, do fairly well in bright indirect light. Um, so those are the ones that do best in most of our homes. And that's why they're the most popular. And they're also more, more popular because they can be cloned easily. Um, so that's the one that we wanna do in bright indirect light. Slipper orchids can be a little bit less light and a little bit um, more of like a, I would say a west facing window maybe, um, or north facing for the slipper orchids. They don't wanna have bright direct sunlight on them. Um, and then there's even orchids who will be like, yes, I wanna be out in the summer sun, but that's not too common. <laughs> so there's so many different orchids out there 
um, but I'm mainly going to say with the moth or the phalaenopsis, again, bright indirect light, which means probably not a south facing window, but also not also in your room on the dining table away from the window. You want to have it kind of near the window, but not bright direct light. And that's kind of tough, right? Because in our homes, we want to enjoy the orchids where we are. Um, so what I recommend sometimes is when you have company, when you have decorating for the holidays, put it with you for a few hours and then put it back or have a grow light that it sits under. Um, so you can buy supplemental grow lights for that if you want to have it in an interior place instead of sitting in a window in your home. So thanks, April. Um, I'm going to scroll back because I feel like I missed somebody in the scrolling here. Um, is it too late to fertilize your African violets now, asked Faye. Yeah, I would discontinue um, fertilizing them for the next couple months, January, February, and then start again in March. And I just use a weak solution of liquid African violet fertilizer when I water the violets. So just a couple drops on the soil or in the water when you water your African violets and they just keep on blooming and blooming. So. Um, you can buy them now um, at Homestead and they're bloomed and forced into bloom now and then those blooms will finish and again then you'll give them fertilizer towards the end of winter into early spring is when you'll start to fertilize your African violets again. Um, I think I caught up with everybody in the chat here and I think we're a little bit past eight o'clock but we did start a little late so that's fine to go a bit over and any more questions or comments from the Facebook page? I'm checking right now. Mm -hmm. I think I'm caught. I'm going to scroll back again through the chat because I feel like. Yeah, I think you're caught up. Yay. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to um, thank you, Faye. Thanks. And thanks, everybody, for joining. And just sum up by saying enjoy your holidays and, you know, uh, like many of us gardeners, we give plants as gifts, buy one for yourself, right? <laughs> if you fall in love with a beautiful plant and you give it a new home, that's a great thing. But treat yourself this holiday, like treat yourself well and gently. And I'm going to scroll back through here just to show a few more of these plants. Some of them are, are fairly inexpensive and really easy care and really fun way to um, make our way through some of these shorter um, stress-free days, right? Where we're, we're missing our gardens outside, but we can enjoy our indoor gardens just as much. All right, thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Homestead Gardens, again, for hosting this. And if you want to watch this again or missed any portion of it, this will be up on the Homestead Gardens Facebook page and on their YouTube channel shortly.